Uh, so today, you know, it says examples and confidence intervals. We're really going to talk about one example, um, but I thought it was going to be more. So it started plus, but we'll see. Um, we have lots of other examples, but I wanted to talk about this one today. <clears throat> uh, but before we do that, uh, announcements, uh, same talk thing, but then Project 2 was released. If you haven't looked at Piazza yet today, it came out this morning, uh, along with homework six, I believe. Um, so just keep in mind, right, the projects are big. Uh, so leaving them to the last minute is probably going to go poorly. So uh, and remember, there are two check ins before the final due date. So please make sure you submit those on time. Uh, you can work with one other partner, so you don't have to do it by yourself. Uh, and I definitely recommend working with others. Um, I think in general, working with others is a good idea. So that's project two. Any questions for any, especially if anybody's looked at it already? All righty. Uh, so we'll move right into this example. Um, so there was a post on, let's say, Facebook, I don't know, some social media site. Um, you know, graphic on the top, right? You know, of course, uh, pithy text underneath. Uh, and this is kind of what it said. Um, I broke it up a little bit to talk about various pieces, uh, but this was attached to a picture. Um, and we'll talk about the picture in a few minutes. Um, but a couple of things I wanted to point out here. Um, so this is kind of uh, the language here is um, inflammatory in a sense. Uh, and so I'm curious to know, so, you know, this is just written and kind of not even just going by the like content itself. Are there any tricks or are there any things here that strike you as particularly cause for inflammatory material? Like, so what about this text might be different from say a news article that would be the same thing, or at least an un, you know relatively unbiased news article? Does anybody have any ideas, any comments on what um, is different here than might be in uh, something that's not trying to be inflammatory, whether it actually is or not? So what do you see? And this is really obvious stuff, not even, like I said, not even things like word choice or, um, you know, kind of the overall concept, uh, just literally in how the text is written. Come on, somebody's got to see something. Yeah. Okay, so that is a good example. This is actually. Um, a more sophisticated example. I'm not even looking for something as complicated as, um, like I said, kind of like word choice or inflammatory like language. I'm talking about even even simpler than that. Obviously, having uh, decent English grammar uh, will also help. So, anybody who learned English as a second language, you're probably better off doing this than. Most people who grew up in the US speaking English because usually their grammar is terrible. So, any other ideas? Are you so inured to this kind of uh, writing that it's, it's not even inflammatory or you're not even noticing it anymore? That's kind of interesting. Come on, any other ideas? Yeah, that's true, but that's like I said, it's a, that's actually in the pictures in a second. So we'll talk about the numbers in a minute. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of trying to point out. So in the first or second lecture, right, I talked about bull shrimp. This is kind of one of those examples. Um, and the reason is, is because these things I'm pointing out. So I'll point out one really obvious one. Uh, notice certain of the text is in red. Okay, why is it in red? Any ideas? Is it somehow special? 
Right, so red in particular, there is definitely science behind uh, different colors kind of cause different responses. You notice a lot of company logos are blue, for example. And the reason is because blue tends to be more uh, kind of a more of a positive feeling or, you know, evokes it. But this is in red. So first of all, it's kind of inflammatory. But given the audience that they're targeting, the State Department is a government entity, right? And so they want to call it out by using red to show that it's bad. Okay. So that's the first thing. Again, if you saw this in a news article, it would not be highlighted in red. Okay. What else? I have, let's see, I have a list of one, two, three, four, at least. Any other ideas? Anything else that's wrong? Go ahead. Yes, weird capitalization. Oh, sorry, I forgot. There is another red uh, thing up there too, which is, uh, you know, kind of inflammatory. Also, vote tallies violate, okay? None of those things should be capitalized in that sentence. The reason they're capitalized is to draw your attention. One of the other things that happens with capitalization, generally speaking, if you've ever read um, like a legal document, like a contract, certain parts of that contract must be in all caps. Okay, if you've ever noticed this, the reason is, is because when you're reading English, capital letters slow you down. So if something is written in all caps, you actually read it more slowly. And so in a contract, it's to get you to pay attention to those pieces because you have to read it more carefully to parse it. In this case, it's getting you to notice that section by using all, or not all caps, but at least capital letters that are quote unquote inappropriate, right? They don't belong there. This is not a title of an article or something. It's just capital letters. All right, any others? All right, so. I would point out some analysts, okay? Uh, in particular, as in, well, like who, right? Like is some one, is some thousands, okay? Like there's no, there's, it's just a broad claim, right? Um, that, you know, these analysts, wh whoever they are, um, agree with this state, okay? So that's the first thing. Um, basically the two things that are in red, uh, that's another thing, right? Tallies and State Department, I pointed out the, First one because I forgot about the other one. Um, and then this one is also, oh, and then the capitalization, which we talked about. Then this one is interesting an accepted test for catching election fraud. Accepted by who? Right? Like, what test? All right. Is there, you know, is there some universal dictionary of accepted tests claimed by the State Department and forensic accounts? Okay. So, first of all, the State Department, to the best of my knowledge, does not publish a list of accepted tests for catching uh, election fraud. I don't think they actually publish anything like that. Like they don't, they don't put out fraud warnings really at all. So that's my knowledge. Um, and forensic accountants. Okay, so like who? Like what, what firm, for example, of forensic accountants uses this accepted test? So the reason I put this out, who knows? It could all be true, right? But it's not really backed up by anything. And this is what's important about reading stuff like this is like, you know, you want to second guess what you're reading because it could, like I said, it could all be true. The thing is, is that if it was, right, why is this in red? Why is that we've got the weird capitalization? Why, you know, why don't you name who you're talking about? Okay, or, or link to where the State Department website publishes lists of election fraud tech tests. So these are the things that, you know, generally speaking, I look at that and I go, huh, all right. You know, I don't believe you to begin with, but let's look at your data, okay? And so in order to give you a little bit of background, um, you know, both for US elections as well as uh, this particular election, which was the 2020 election uh, for president, uh, the data that they're talking about in the picture I'm going to show you is specifically about this uh, about Milwaukee, which I almost call the state, but it's a city. Um, and so, first of all, 70% of the votes in Milwaukee were for Biden. Okay, so the two people running, if you didn't already know, were Biden and Trump. Um, 
half of all the wards. So a ward is basically kind of like, generally speaking, the smallest unit of vote population. Okay. Um, and so, you know, uh, like I live in Ward 62, it's called uh, in Boston. And so the smallest unit. Um, and so if you see like Milwaukee, good sized city, but these wards, right, they're about 570 to 1200 votes. Okay, that's not even population, that's the number of people who actually voted. Um, and then the logarithmic average to kind of give you an idea of the size, right, is about 800. Um, and the US, so the other thing to keep in mind for looking at this data, um, technically while the US is open party system, it is in, for all practical purposes, two parties, particularly at the national level. Um, although if you look at the mayoral race in Boston right now, the only two candidates uh, who kind of made it through the earlier rounds of voting are actually both Democrats. Um, so when you get down to the local level, it gets a little weirder, but broad spectrum, if you're talking about national level politics, it's generally a two party system, the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, and this is important to look at the map. That's why I mentioned it in particular. So this is the graphic that went with it. Um, and the reason I want to pull out separately so I can kind of label it, because the graphic is quite fuzzy, even when I have the first version of it, um, much less trying to blow it up on a slide. Um, so here you see um, the votes for um, the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, and there you see the Trump, um, Trump, bleh, Trump Pence ticket, uh, and basically uh, kind of trying to show how they're broken down. Um, and then these are other candidates, but even though you can't tell from this graphic, which is a little bit of like one of the many problems with this graphic, um, those, these four other graphs are vanishingly small numbers. So, you know, they may not even matter to the overall count because there's probably at least, I didn't actually look at the numbers, but you know, the top two left or top left two there are probably 95 or more percent of the vote. Okay. Um, so, and then what they did was they tried to compare, and we talked about Benford's law. Uh, they drew a graph of the Benford's law uh, calculation, uh, you know, uh, line. I can't think of the right word. Um, so, as you can see, as we talked about the other day, right? So, one has a very high chance of being the digit. Uh, that's in the uh, vote counts, um, and then all the way out to nine, right? So it drops off uh, weirdly, right? So according to this thing, right? Um, you know, like I said, that the text was on, on this graphic. Um, the argument here is because the numbers don't follow Benford's law, uh, therefore there's voter fraud here, but there isn't here because it does seem to follow it, or pretty close, right? So y'all being Benford's law experts now, does that seem like plausible? Is that a decent argument? Like just on the face of it, it's a pretty decent argument, right? Except we know a bunch of different things that tell us that, you know, is this an evidence of election fraud? All right, well, I'll tell you right off the bat, um, as a big, huge hint, right, that it is not election fraud or evidence of election fraud using the argument that they made. Now, that I'm not saying at all, right, there may have been election fraud, but this particular argument not only is not a recognized mechanism for the State Department to or forensic analysis to do uh, look for election fraud by any stretch of the imagination, um, but on top of that, um, it, it just like we know enough about the the situation that we know this is wrong. So looking back at this, here's just the exact same picture, uh, just to bring it back. What I wanna know is let's have some theories about why this is not evidence of election fraud, like I said, just based on the Benford law portion. And I reiterate, uh, the facts that I kind of set up to begin with, right? The range of votes for any given ward. So basically, if you look at these, right, the numbers here are the different ward votes, okay? So any given ward, if you add them, or like the total in there are about, it was like 540 to 1700 votes. Um, 
That was one kind of fact. We also know it's roughly a two-party system, so most of these graphs don't matter. Um, and then those are two salient uh, facts. I can't remember what else I said. Um, but so does anybody have any theories about why this is not an accurate use of Benford's law? Yeah. Uh, leading digit. So, so this is the number of votes you got that started with a one, right? That, yeah. There are any theories? Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, like, but that's so yes, but um, the problem with that is that it, it would still theoretically follow Benford's law, it, like, just because they have all the individual vote counts, right? So, this is taking the number of wars that had a vote count for Biden that led with one, right? So I don't, like I said, I don't know how many it is. Let's see, uh, 475 different wards. And they looked at each individual ward and said, how many votes were in that ward? Um, and counted up the ones that had a leading one. So it, you're actually on the right track, but not quite for the reason you said. All right. What's what's uh, one thing we know about the range of those numbers? Right, is that the range of the ward values? Right, are between whatever it was five seventy and seventeen hundred. Okay, so for all four hundred seventy five, all values must be between five hundred seventy and seventeen hundred. Okay, so what does that tell you? What was one of the major tenets of Benford's law where it becomes accurate versus inaccurate? Anybody remember? It was a term that most of you had not or did not remember hearing before, which I think I explained. All right, with that narrow a gap, okay, the orders of magnitude are too few for Benford's law to be particularly applicable, all right? So when I, as I said before, right, orders of magnitude are basically when you start adding zeros on, on ones, right? So, you know, you have an order of magnitude difference between zero and 10, or 10 and 100, or 100 and 1,000, or 1,000 and 10,000 ad infinitum, right? So in this case, we only have arguably one or two orders of magnitude difference between them. As a result, you should second guess whether or not Benford's law is going to be applicable. To this scenario. Does that make sense? So that's the first thing. The next thing is kind of what you were alluding to. Does anybody have any other ideas about why do I keep harping on the fact that it's a two party system? Because half the, oh, well, because some percent of the votes have to go to one candidate. And then the other half or the other percent, right, have to go to the other kid. There's only two choices, like you said, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so in other words, if this candidate gets a one starting number, this candidate needs to get a like counter number. So let's just say nine, you know. Um, this is, you know, use real numbers, it makes a lot more sense. But uh, you know, two and eight, right, etc. So in other words, you, you one or the other can follow Benford's law possibly, but they can't both, they have to be inverses of each other because there's only two choices. So if I have, um, you know, the example, actually I'll get to this slide. So yeah, you know, the example of looking at that kind of median, right? So if there's 800, let's say the available votes, Biden, let's say, gets, you know, 20, or, sorry, 200 of those votes. How many votes will Trump get? 
Come on, 800 minus 200. Somebody knows what 800 minus 200 is. Thank you. All right. So that means that the other person has to get 600 votes. So therefore, the whole thing is skewed, right? Because if, especially in a two party system, you know, arguably, if you had a lot more uh, people getting, you know, if all these other people were getting in the same ballpark of votes, then you know, you might see something different. But in this case, they must be inverses of each other. Of some kind, like, yeah, actually an inverse altogether. So in other words, if Biden got 70% of the vote, then Trump had to get 30% of the vote. So as a result, one or the other of them can't have a Benford's law map because the, the basically the map wouldn't flip over and then and still work, right? You would end up with the wrong number of votes. So that was another example. Um, So this is kind of it written out a little bit more. So first of all, the changes to order of magnitude, right there, that's a huge problem with this proposal, okay? Is that you can't do changes. If you don't have enough changes to order of magnitude, it's just gonna start falling apart. Um, it only works for large ones or large sets of those. Um, so kind of elaborating on the example I just gave, we know that 70% of the votes went to Biden because we looked at the total. So of 800, so it's about 560. So that means that most of the numbers for Biden should actually be fives. That makes sense, right? Because if he got, you know, kind of the 70% marker of an average of 800, then we know that they're mostly going to be fives, right? And then probably some fours and sixes, right? Because of variability. And then the reverse of that, right, is that Trump is going to get you know, threes, I don't know if I wrote this up here, uh, or again, twos, um, and, you know, some ones and threes, because they're going to get the inverse. So as a result, these are definitely not going to map to Benford's law. And interestingly, if you look here, right, this is why Trump's looks like it maps to Benford's law. Just happened to work out that way. Could just as easily have been, you know, uh, a much more, if it was a much closer match in this particular area, instead of 70% going by, let's say it was 51%, 49%, Trump's wouldn't have matched it either, right? Because everybody's would have been fives. That makes sense? Um, and then the other thing is that lots and lots of research scientists have really wanted this to work and have spent literally decades trying to get it to work, even so far as to look at things like um, the second digit, because there's also laws around the second digit and how often and what that uh, distribution looks like, um, but it still doesn't work. So, uh, you know, so if you can't just take kind of the rational approach, you can actually go to the experts and they'll tell you right off the bat that no, this just doesn't work. Okay, you, you, like we've done lots and lots of research and it doesn't work uh, in, in almost any scenario. Um, so if you want to learn more about it. Um, so what's funny though, is that, you know, I pulled this uh, quote out of one of these, I think it was this one, um, but it does work all the time. Like it works a ton, right? Um, the one that I thought was particularly interesting was river lengths, right? Um, and so if you go and measure all the rivers on Earth, um, they follow Benford's law in terms of lengths and their distribution of the first digit, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so here are some articles. Uh, you know, we usually post the slides so you can get to the links. Um, and then if you prefer other methods of consumption around this particular topic, which I think is particularly interesting, uh, there's a podcast, Radio Lab, if you're not familiar with it, is an amazing podcast. They have lots of good stuff in general. I highly recommend it. Uh, but this particular one, they talked about this particular scenario. Um, and then there's a documentary on Netflix um, that uh, the, basically the fourth episode uh, actually quotes or interviews a bunch of these people. I think one, of, one or two of them are actually in this one too, um, who are Benford's laws, uh, law um, like experts. Uh, and so 
if you want to hear more about it, uh, you can consume those. Um, like I said, the links will be posted uh, if you're interested. Um, and uh, I, I will reiterate, Radio Lab's amazing. Check it out if you never have. All right, any questions? So the reason I brought this up, right, is a couple of things. One, I think it's a good example of where, you know, kind of stats fail you, right? So there's these techniques, um, you know, if you've never heard the old quote of, uh, you know, lies, damn lies and statistics, um, when you can very easily use statistics or, you know, a lot of these techniques that we're talking about inappropriately, you can use them incorrectly and you can make them sound plausible, okay? So the reason I bring it up is a couple of things. When you're seeing stuff like this, read it carefully. Look for what the goal of the author is trying to accomplish, right? Um, and if it's doing weird things like, you know, unattributed quotes, weird capitalization, color highlighting, you know, all those kinds of things, um, they're clearly trying to make you feel a certain way um, rather than trying to present you the facts. They might sometimes, right? It, it's for good, right? In the sense that they may be trying to inflame you to get you to do something that's maybe positive or negative. I, I'm not really necessarily making a judgment on it as much as to say, read it carefully, look for what they're trying to accomplish with their writing or their graphics and evaluate it analytically rather than you know, kind of succumbing to that content as an emotional response. Um, and like I said, one of the biggest tricks is to use, I, don't, I hate to say like grammatically incorrect writing, um, because, but it does work, uh, you know, if you look at the content. And so next time you're, you know, on Instagram and, you know, perusing, you know, various content, you invariably will get ads or, you know, maybe brands you follow or stuff like that. Look for this kind of stuff because it does work. And then kind of related to that, a lot of times they try to present data behind it, dig into the data a little bit, try to figure out is the, is the thing they're presenting you, does it actually follow the rules around that thing? Um, or are they just trying to put a big high block? On? So that's why I want to point it out. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting case uh, and it happened just a couple of years ago. Um, and <laughs> there's a very good chance it will happen again soon. Um, all right, so moving on to um i can't remember what did we title this thing oh uh confidence intervals um kind of starting from the beginning so the first thing we're going to talk about is percentiles and uh notice the little icon uh so this is something we're going to uh need to be able to repeat right so i think this is a weird turn of phrase um but like the Oh, sorry. I thought I fixed this. Okay. So does anybody know what the 80th percentile of this list of numbers is? Yeah. So yes, um, generally speaking, you just talk about the uh, bottom one um, and assume the rest are above it, right? So the, 80th percentile is just uh, the 80th, not, not all of it, you know what I mean? Um, but yes. So how do we figure that out? Okay, well, so it's the first value on a note sorted list. I thought I had made this one. Uh, I made it unsorted on the prior slide, which would have been me. Um, but the list has to be sorted. And it's at least as large as X percent of the elements. Uh, and so the 80th percentile of the 80th percent of the elements. Um, so if you think about it in terms of uh, the percentages, what you can do is you take 80 over 100 and then you multiply it by the number of elements in the list or the set. Um, and so in this case, you get four. And so it's right here, but it's not the three because the list isn't sorted. So what we do is we sort it first. Uh, and then we get the seven as the element that we care about. Um, does that make sense? Okay, so here's where it's going to get not making sense, at least in my opinion. Um, oh, wait, hold on. 
Oh, before we get to that, another bit first. Okay, so here we have a little bit of a challenge. We want to talk about the 50th percentile of this list. Okay. Um, so we do the math, right? We get 50 divided by 100 and then multiply by five, we end up with two and a half. Okay. So despite the math working out this way, you always round up. Okay. So even though this rounded is actually three, no matter what, um, you always round up. So even if this was 2.1, it would still be three. Does that make sense? You always go up. Or um, typically, this is one of those ones where I don't know if its origin was in math or something else, but in any kind of programming, this is usually referred to as the ceiling. Um, so whenever you round up, it's another word for that is ceiling. Um, and yeah, so basically you take the next greater element instead. Um, so if you're looking for the 50th, you don't take the two, right? The three there, you take the five. Make sense? Yes. All right. So here's the part that I thought was the prior slide. What about taking a median? Okay. So we've talked about NP median before. Um, and so does anybody know what this would be? Like we've definitely talked about this before because we have an even number of elements. What does this work out to be? Yeah. Oh, it's an odd number. Oh, sorry. I guess we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, yeah, so six uh, is the median, my bad. Um, so and in this case, uh, 50 over 100 times six is three. Uh, and so it's a six here. And so that's the 50th percentile. It's conveniently in the middle. and Apparently, I'm like one slide off today. Um, so we talk about. Oh, sorry. There you go. Oh, no, I have a bug. Yeah, sorry. There's not supposed to be a 10. In there. My bad. I thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, so you were correct, it was six, but I made a mistake in making the slide. Um, it was supposed to be basically the median is the average, like according to NP, right? According to NumPy, the median is the average of the middle two elements if you have uh, an even numbered set of elements. Um, for this, for the percentile, what we want is the one that kind of meets the same requirement that we talked about before which is that it's kind of the number that is at that point or above it, and it must be in the set. Um, so uh, and do y'all know when I say set, right? Like I just mean the list, um, you know, it's, it is a mathematical term. Uh, you actually use it in programming a lot too, um, but a, basically you have a set and then you have different types of sets. You could have like an array, you could have a list or whatever. So the more generic term is set. That's why I tend to use the term set a lot. Um, so it should be the median. How did I screw this up? Yeah, all right. So if you're looking for the 50th percentile, you're always looking for one that is actually in the set that is equal to or above the middle, OK? If you're looking for 50th, for example. And obviously, this is a unique case where it's just the 50th percentile where you kind of have this problem largely. Um, but, you know, in general, you want to do the division, you want to make sure that that number is in the set. And so you kind of do it by position rather than doing it through math. Whereas NP median literally like does the math to figure out what the median is. Um, and so we're introducing a new function here that is on the data science library uh, called percentile. And I can't believe I screwed up the prior slide. Um, but so the smallest value of a set that is at least as large as P percent. And yeah, and it's just percentile. So you give it the number, it must be between zero and 100, as you might imagine. Um, and then the list of values that you want. The nice thing is this list of values doesn't have to be sorted. 
it will sort it and then find you the position that you're looking for. Make sense? All right. Uh, and now we will look at an example, which is pretty cool. All right, so first we're just going to make a, an array of um, items. Uh, and so, you know, they are currently unsorted. Uh, so, what we generally do is we take a look at the sorted version. Um, and I think we've used this a whole mess of times. Um, and so, we can do the sort, but we can make it a little easier for us later. And maybe we'll call it x sorted or equals. MP sort. I don't think I have that later, do I? No. All right. And so now we have that in another variable. Um, and what we want to do is kind of solve for that problem. Um, and what I'm kind of curious for is like, can you all help me write a round up function? Okay. Uh, you know, so if I wasn't going to use the percentile thing, I want to do it by hand. Um, how would I go about it? Right. So basically, oh, actually, let me introduce one other thing too. Um, I know I've used this before, but I'm not sure if I've talked about it. Um, a lot of times when I want to show kind of intervening values, right, I'll actually make individual cells and print that value, right? If you use this command, print like this. And you just separate your things with commas, it will just print them separated with a tab, kind of all in a row. They won't be labeled or anything, but it's a good cheat for if you just want to see what the output is. Um, so you just kind of keep separating them with commas, you know, until you're until you figure out everything you want, uh, and just keep going. So I'm just doing that here to make it a little easier to talk about it. So as we talked about, right, we want to take that calculations we want to find the 55th percentile of six elements because we know there's six up there obviously we could just actually ask for the length of that array and we would get the same number we get the six right so if i want to do this and what i have to do is i need to take that number right i need to round it up in just in case it's not a natural easy number and then take the sorted value thing and then find that position, but then I also have to subtract one because it's zero. Make sense? So how would I do the round up part? Any ideas? Yeah. So if num mod, sorry, one. Now we're going to get into my mixing languages here. Um, I think that's how you do. Is that how you do nami? Um, and you also have to spell num correctly. This is not how I did it, so it's going to be harder. Um, so mod one is not equal to zero. Then what do you want to do? So basically what you want to do kind of in the abstract sense, right, is you want to take the number that was passed in, right, because at this point, we're going to pass in float pause here, right, so we know this is going to be, um, you know, some, some float, right, so what we want to do is we want to take that, we want to lop off the, the right side of it, right, everything past the decimal, then we want to either take that number, or if it had, like if the decimal was zero, or if the decimal is greater than zero, then we want to uh, add one, right? That's the basics of what we want to do. So we can continue down this path or we can try a different path. It's up to you. Let's see. So what is num mod one going to be?
Yeah. Okay. So what you're doing here, right, is lopping off the decimal portion, right? So that'll give you either zero if there was no decimal portion. Um, so what do we do in that case? So why don't we do a little trick and just say out equals zero. So out equals what would out be there? So we know that the decimal is um, there, like there was no decimal portion, even though there is a, a point zero, right? So what would we put there? So I'll show you a trick, which is you just cast it to an int, which will throw out the decimal portion. Okay. So I didn't do spell trick, but um, so. It's something to keep in mind. This does not round, it just chops it off. Okay. So, but we've already verified that it will be um, that it's even or that it has no decimal portion. So, okay, so there's the out. And then we'd all obviously have to do an else. And what do we do in that scenario? No, because so now we know that the decimal is greater than zero, right? In this else case. So what do we want to do in the case that it's greater than zero? Anybody else have an answer? Yes. We can um, add one and then get rid of the end. Yeah, but I would go in reverse. But yes, I would cast it to the end first and then add one. I don't know if it's just a stylistic thing or what, but that's how I would. Um, and then we can return out, right? Um, and so either way, out will be correct because you can you can't get through an if else without doing one of them. So then we should get what did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot I added this to make it clear. All right, and so like I said before, um, you know, no labeling, so it's a little yucky, but it does make my life easier to kind of see them all at once. Um, so my original division is this float pause, right? So it's 3.3. .3. Then I pass it into my little roundup function just to see what I get out of it, and I get a three. Okay. Then I take that three basically here, right? I sort my array list first, then I call the roundup. I'll get the three back there, then I subtract one. And so I should get uh, the third position, right? Which is um, 28 when it's sorted. Make sense? All right. And then just for the sake of kind of seeing a different way of approaching it, and in case I care later, um, oops. This was how I wrote it. So what I did was I cast the number first and locked off the right. Then I checked to see if the original number was bigger than the uh, locked off number. And if it was, then I just add one. Does that make sense? So problem the same thing. Um, I couldn't tell you for like me which one of those might be better, um, but that's how I approached it. Um, however, we're getting two different answers, so that's not good. I don't know, whatever. I'll figure it out later. Um, long story short, both of those should work. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's, I think you have a bug in here, but I'm not sure what it is, because I know it is supposed to be four. Um, oh, actually, we did know it was supposed to be four, because I misspoke. So what's wrong with this up here? Didn't I do that all right? Oh, there's got to be an else if? No. no. 
Oh, uh, is it just backwards? Oh, yeah, 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 it's backwards in a, in a different way. So what we want is just that should be right. Yes, that looks better. Uh, if I if I've been standing near the cheat sheet when I looked at it, because um, when it, I'm not seeing the story version, it's harder. So correct, but long story short, I think that's part of why I went this direction is that um, I like to do this. I like to do operations the smallest number of times possible. So. In my version, I only did the casting to int once, right? So I only had to call a function of unknown, of like unknown complexity one time. Um, whereas here we have to do the same operation twice. So, like I said, in this example, it's probably essentially immaterial, um, but that's why stylistically I would probably choose this. Um, and in my way, it's uh, for the slow people. Uh, like myself, uh, it's, I think, more obvious that it's right. Um, but yeah, sorry about that. This is why I have a cheat sheet, is what I say. Doing it on the fly is very difficult. Um, all right, so I wanted to show you a slightly different way of doing this um, that makes it so we don't have to write our own roundup function. And I gave you a hint about what this is earlier. Does anybody know what function I might be able to use so that there's a built-in round up function? Anyone know what that is? I did give you a hint. I mentioned what it's called, sort of. All right, so you remember I mentioned that ceiling is usually the term for round up in programming. Um, so, I don't duplicate my code here. Oops. So, unfortunately, and I would say this is actually relatively unusual in my opinion. Um, Python doesn't actually have a built in ceiling function, but again, programmers are lazy, can't type out ceiling, that's far too long. Um, so, it's just seal. You will see seal in most languages. Um, and so, in this case, we're going to pull it off NumPy. There's actually another one in a different library that's used all the time on the map library. Um, but it does exactly what Roundup does, except when you can build, use a built in function to do something, it is almost always going to be better than the version you did um, because it will be optimized to the nth degree, right? Um, so, you know, if I was actually going to write this, I would do this ceiling. The thing to keep in mind is always kind of test your outputs. And the reason is, let me see if I can, I don't think I have the thing written here. But so this uh, third position here is a 4.0. So ceiling returns a float, which I find very odd, right? Given that it specifically is creating an instance. Um, so it returns a float. You know what doesn't like a float? Indexing. So you have to cast it to an integer in order to get it to work. So all of these things are to prove why you should use none of this mechanism and instead uh, you know, write your own function or, you know, use somebody else's. And so we can just use the percentile function that's built into the data science library, um, which takes the percentile we want and the array and outputs the value at that position. Um, obviously, sometimes what you want to know is actually the, like, the position number. Um, so it's not as useful then. But if you're actually looking for that value it's just kind of built in you don't have to worry about doing the casting you don't have to worry about having stupid mistakes um and so it's usually much better if you can use like i said before some kind of built-in library it will like i said most of the time be better uh than your implementation um 
except when it doesn't quite do what you want. Like I said, because it doesn't give you any way to find out what the position is, and maybe that's something you need. All right, making sense so far? Even though I keep like stumbling over my feet today. Um, all right, let me just see. Yeah, let's go back to the slides for a minute. And so um, let's do by show of hands, okay? Um, so given the X above, right? Given that array, what is the 10th percentile of X? Is it equal to zero? Raise your hand if you think that statement is true. And remember, equal to equals is rather than assigning is a test. Um, and I know that can be kind of confusing. I find it confusing, but just keep in mind double equals just means a test versus an assignment. Um, so raise your hand if you think that's actually, let's do it this way. Raise your right hand if you think this is a true statement. Raise your left hand if you think it's a false statement. All right. Um, how about you in the white mask? Um, why is it a false statement? It should be going by ish. Okay, but remember that the rule is um, it's like the next highest. So this doesn't have to be exact. So if I say the 10th percentile, it means like the one that's above it. Okay, it doesn't matter if that's at 20% or 72%. It's just the next one that's above it. Um, so close to right, it, it is a false statement. Um, any other theories as to why or what else is wrong with it? Let's put it that way. And, and you think the answer is what? Like what, like instead of, you know, what should this be over here? One, yeah. So. Any other theories as to why this is incorrect? Or something, at least for me, this is what makes it most obviously incorrect or false. Yeah. Right. So the rule with this do wacky, right, is that it has to, the value has to appear in the set. So if the zero isn't in the set, right off the bat, you know it's not right. Okay. Uh, even if you're not 100% sure why, you know immediately it's wrong. Okay. Um, all right, so what about the second one? What did I say? Right hand for true, left hand for false. Um, will the percentile of like the 40th percentile uh, be, um, sorry, be the same as the 39th percentile on the same array in, in this particular case? This is not an always case. And he gave you a big hint by telling you it was the 20th percentile. I had the first one was 20th percentile. All right, so sorry, right hands true, left hands false. More hands. More hands. Now I have to figure out which one's right and which one's left. Keep going, hands up, hands up. Let's see. All right, so this one is true, okay? Um, because it's the next one up, right? So they're both five. Does that make sense? Or equal to or above. So 40th percentile is the five, and the 39th is like slightly below five, so it's also five. Make sense? Hopefully I don't have any stupid typos on this slide. Like apparently I have a huge raft of today. Um, okay, what about the next one? True and false, 40 and 41%. Uh, sorry, right hand is true, left hand is false. Hands up. All right, so the right hands have it, uh, despite, sorry, no, the left hands have it. The right hands had it the time before. Um, like I said, apparently I'm just off today. Uh, so, you know, have you ever seen the show The Price is Right? Raise your hand if you've seen The Price is Right or know what it is. 
All right, so what, what is the key thing about money in the price is right? Can we remember? Right, uh, equal without going over. So the whole game is guessing the price of things, uh, hence price is right. Uh, but if you go over it, you lose. Uh, so in this case, right, you went over it by hitting 41. So therefore you're onto the 15. And on this side, you're at the 40, which is the five. So they are not equal. All right, let's see. Now the last one, um, looking at my cheat sheet this time, so I don't make a stupid mistake again. Um, so what's the 50th percentile of the set for this one? Uh, is this a true statement? Is it 15 or is it not? So uh, true is right hand, false is left hand. All right, so it is true. What is the NP median of this set? Is that also equal to 15? True or false? Do the same right and left hand. All right, yeah, it's also the same. Very easy one there. Um, we have just looking at the, the time versus how much we have left. All right, so, uh, you know, long story short, uh, throw out what you knew about median, uh, kind of when we're talking about this stuff going forward, unless we explicitly say uh, to use the like mathematical median, we mean the set median like this, okay? So if you're, you know, if you see a question on like the final exam or you see a question in the homework or whatever, um, just keep in mind, we're using this median, not the uh, mathematical one. I will probably try to make sure that the text is clear either direction because I don't, I really don't like trick questions. But when we say median in this context, we mean something that's in the set, okay? Not the division. All right, estimation. Which we've talked about for sure. Um, so I thought this was a, a really funny way to put it as a flowchart because I love flowcharts that just kind of stop. Um, so when we're talking about, let's see, actually, why don't we go to an example before we do that? Um, so Really interesting. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but uh, a lot of the data about the Boston government um, is actually publicly available on the internet. Um, most government data in the US is actually publicly available, um, if not easily, then through what's called a FOIA request or a Freedom of Information, Freedom of Information Act request. Um, but Boston has uh, kind of gone around that by actually just releasing the data. Um, so this I pulled down from like the boston.gov website, uh, which is all of the salaries of all of the employees of the city of Boston. Um, it actually has all of their names in the data set, but for the sake of, I don't really need to broadcast everyone's salary who works for the city. Um, I uh, stripped that out and made up an employee ID for them just so that we can kind of keep track of who is who. Um, so basically what this is, the salary data, um, this is what they make like at the end of the day, at the end of the year, um, but it can be coming in in a bunch of different components. So this is their actual salary, right? Then maybe they got, they didn't get paid something from the prior year. Other money, overtime, which is a huge deal in the Boston Police Department. Um, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and then you know payments because you you were put on the job or something you know so you're still getting paid somehow um and then detail is um or i i assume this i actually forgot to look up this one but i assume detail is another it's another police related thing where um if you've ever if you've ever seen construction and there's like a top uh with the construction of boston that's referred to as a detail um and so that's a, a kind of it's a special kind of overtime basically um and then there's this education incentive and then earnings and then this is postal code so the zip code they, they live in um and then i just threw this year in because it's from this year um actually actually it's probably 2020 uh i may have made a mistake there it didn't have a year 
um, but it can't possibly be correct for this year, right? Because we don't know how much people made this year yet because it's not the end of the year. So that is probably a mistake, probably should be 2020 now that I think about it. Um, so, but for the sake of this demonstration, it really doesn't make any difference. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is we just wanna look at um, who makes the most money. Um, and so Boston Police Department, police lieutenant, and what I think is interesting, right? They make about $145,000 a year, but then they make $131,000 in whatever other is, $124,000 in overtime pay, um, and then an extra $45,000 standing around in construction pay, or a total of $365,000. So clearly, I should have been a cop. Um, and you know, as you can see, actually, in our particular city, um, I don't just by way of I didn't look at this data terribly closely. Um, I know there are Boston Public School uh, professionals in there, like teachers and nurses and stuff like that. I know there's police department people. I assume the mayor is in there, um, but I didn't actually look. So the broad categories I saw were definitely like teachers and police. Um, but there should be other stuff in there. But as you can see, there's uh, 21,000 rows, and I just didn't notice any other. Um, but long story short, the highest paid people in the city all work for the Boston Police Department. Um, and then we can kind of look at the other end of the spectrum, which is the lowest paid employees. And so uh, the reason I left this in is uh, because it shows an example of a typical problem which is that your data is often not very clean, okay? So there are a lot of people in the city who made less than $5 last year, okay? So my guess is, right, kind of just throwing it out there, if you notice, it's a bunch of substitute teachers, right? So maybe it was, you know, some sort of travel-related expense, so they had to go to a meeting or something, um, but they didn't actually work. Uh, so. A substitute teacher, basically, you have a teacher that's out sick. You use a substitute teacher um, to replace that person who's out sick for the day. Um, and usually they're like retired teachers or things like that. Um, so I'm not 100% sure why a bunch of them made 38 cents last year, but that's what it says. So there you go. So, but the point is, is that if we actually are trying to do some sort of research into the salaries of Boston City employees, like, are, are these real? Like, what are these numbers, right? Um, so we might want to throw them out for the sake of our discussion. Yeah. Um, it could be like the substitute teachers who work for like travel substitute teachers that work outside of like. Yeah. So. District. Right. So they could very well be like a substitute who works multiple school districts, um, and you know each school district is actually owned by the city that it's in or town or whatever. Um, so yeah, they could have jobs in multiple. So yeah, this is not to say that employee, you know, 334 or 3 million, 345,000. Uh, this is also wildly inaccurate for the number of employees. Um, didn't make any other money, just not from the city of Boston. So if we're looking at this data and we want to do some sort of analysis on the salaries of employees of Boston, it would probably be worthwhile to get rid of those employees, right? Um, you know, depending on validity. And this is something we would wanna think about, about what we're trying to do. Um, to get a sense of like, you know, kind of where does it start or whatever. So we see, we, I mean, we really get like all over the place. There's a lot of numbers in there. So instead, why don't we do something like this? Um, and the example I was kind of looking at that kind of informed this actually had um, the number of hours worked that caused the salary that they got. Um, I don't have that data in here, but so we can just kind of manufacture it, right? Um, so it may be a little bit inaccurate because we don't know that they worked all 52 weeks. We don't know that they worked 40 hours a week for those 52 weeks. So we're just gonna kind of guess uh, for the sake of the example. Um, but these are the kinds of things I would think about if I was trying to do this for real. So in order to look at employees who are kind of working for the city 
who are making a quote unquote reasonable salary. If we want to do our salary relationship, in, uh, you know, study whatever it is, um, why don't we take the minimum wage per hour, which in the city of Boston is thirteen dollars and fifty cents, um, and then say hours per week. There's 40, 40 working hours in a week, and then there's fifty-two weeks a year, um, and that's usually how people get paid. So um, the part that gets a little inaccurate, right? If you're uh, if you're not a salaried employee, you often don't work fifty-two weeks a year because you take vacation, for example. Um, as a salaried employee, you do take vacation. You don't work fifty hours a week, but or sorry, fifty-two weeks a year. But you don't count it because the salary covers those fifty-two weeks. So we come up with a minimum salary uh, just to kind of get to a more useful number. And I think it was like twenty grand or so. Um, yeah, twenty-eight grand. So what we want to do next is, okay, let's look at just the people who are over that. Um, and I don't want to run that again because it'll break it. So now, um, oh, actually it'd have to be sorted, but, um, but so what I did was I actually split our Boston salaries into low salaries, right? So everyone who's under our minimum salary, in case we wanted to go and look at that, which might be interesting in different ways, like why are all these people making such a small number of, uh, or a small amount of money? Um, if you notice, why well, I think this is that one is interesting in particular, um, it's quite a lot of people, right? Uh, so what are the 4,061 or something uh, that are below minimum wage if you look at them from a full-time perspective. So it's really a lot of people. So there may be some interesting things that we can discover in there. Um, all right, so to start to take a look at that data. Well, so yeah, so what we can do is we can do some of kind of our normal uh, you know, kind of look at the, the top, bottom, and middle of the data range so we can get an idea of that data set. Um, so the first thing that we do is we pull out the median, um, which is kind of funny because we were just talking about how we're not really using that median, but nonetheless. Um, oh, no, actually, we are using this one. It's the percentile. Never mind. Um, but then we also get the max, and we get the minimum, and so we see... Right, that the highest paid employees we talked about four three hundred sixty five thousand. The lowest paid, because we did that lower bound salary cap, is twenty eight thousand and change. Um, and so then we have those two distribution or two kind of n measures. So what we want to do is we want to start looking at this salary data. Maybe we take a histogram of the data set. Um, I take that min salary that I got, or that I calculated, because I know that's the bottom, right? Because I cut it off there. Um, and then I looked at that max and I said, okay, let's call it 400,000. And then I try to use something reasonable as a, as a step function to get my distribution here, right? And so we kind of get an idea of, hey, you know, credit for financing is this, right? We know somewhere between 100, uh, 100,000 and 150,000 is oh, actually, Let's say 100, and it's like 90,000 or 110,000 um, is, you know, the bulk of our salaries. Uh, you know, we also know that the median was, I don't remember now, probably around 90, 96, is that what that says? 96,000 um, to try to get a sense of this data. And I think because it is five minutes until the end of the lecture, I think we're going to stop there. But what we're going to talk about is, okay, in this case, right, I have all the data, right? But we're going to use this as an exemplar to say, okay, what if I didn't have all the data? How could I generate or how could I create data um, such that I can start to estimate the salaries of the city of Boston employees without actually having access to the full data set? Cool. And I think that's going to be, like I said, it for today. Um, and just
jumping to the end. Uh, just reiterate, project two is out. First checkpoint is on the seventh, which is, is that this Sunday? Yeah, this Sunday. So this coming Sunday, which is uh, what, five days from now? Uh, so look at it soon. Don't wait till Saturday. Um, and uh, you'll have an easier time. All right, thanks everybody.